verse 15. If I am detained, 1 Timothy 3.15, if I am detained, you may know how people ought to conduct themselves in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and stand uh, and stay the proof of support of the truth. And the great and important weighty we confess is the hidden truth, the mystic secret of godliness. He, God, was made invisible in human flesh, justified and vindicated by in the Holy Ghost, seen by angels, preached among the nations, and believed in the world, uh, taken up into glory. You know, Paul is saying here to understand the truth of God's word that we might know how to conduct ourselves, not just in the world, but understand how to live a life victorious in the house of God. And actually, if we were to really break down what Paul is saying here, is how to flourish in the house of the Lord and become a pillar in God's house. Mm -hmm. not, not just somebody that needs a microphone. But somebody that is a pillar, that is a, someone that is helping in the house of God to build the house of the Lord. And he's saying here, he's saying it's important that we understand the truth of God's word so that we can be a pillar in the house of God. That means so that others that are weak, when they come in, we can begin to hold, the, hold up this spiritual house until they're able to grow as well. Amen. See, when you're a pillar in the house, you won't be blown by everything that comes your way. Amen. Quiet in here tonight. You, you, won't be, you, won't be, you won't be blown by every wind of doctrine. Every online teaching that comes your way. You'll know the Word of God inside and out. You'll be able to detect false teaching. You'll be able to detect heretical teaching. You'll be able to detect things that are of the Spirit, those that are not. And you'll be able to also, in turn, be one that others can look to in the house of God as, as a son or a daughter in the, in the house of the Lord and as a, an example of what it means to Walk in the Word and move in the Spirit. See, see. let me tell you something. Smith Wigglesworth, how many know who Smith Wigglesworth is? Smith Wigglesworth, uh, while he was living in, in the nation of England, uh, Bradford actually, was where he, he resided. I've been with Bryn. We went to his house actually prayed for the family that was a uh, Muslim that lived there. They all got saved. Uh, that was several years ago when we were, we were living in England. And we just woke up one morning and Bryn said, I think we need to take a trip over to Bradford. Well, in England, you think it's about 20 minutes away. And a 20-minute trip ends up being about five hours with the road systems they got over there. You're going around those roundabouts, and Brother Charlie was still trying to learn how to drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> Praise God for the angels of God. Amen. Keeping me protected as well as the children and Bryn. But, um, but she felt we were supposed to go over to Bradford and go and visit the house. And some of you may or may not have ever, ever heard me tell this story, but we found the house. Actually, the, later on, the, the, the owners wanted to sell it to us. And we almost bought it and moved to England. You didn't know that, but we wouldn't be here today. If, if the Spirit had told us to move to England, we would have bought the Smith Wigglesworth house and the church uh, and moved over there to Bradford, England. But that wasn't God's will. He wanted us here in Moravian Falls. Uh, but the family did contact us and say, we want to sell you the home. Where It's not even up for sale, but we want to sell it to you. And uh, we went to the front door 
I stood on the porch there. Uh, actually, uh, Nehemiah was with me and uh, knocked on the front door. The woman opened up the door. She said, may I help you? I said, well, yes. I said, is this the home of Smith Wigglesworth? And she looked at me kind of strange. And then she said, well, there was a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth that used to live here. But now my family owns it. And she said, are you one of those crazy Christians? <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, we've had many people come here and knock on the door. In fact, uh, she said, as you can see, the numbers are gone off of the, off of the house. And I said, yeah. Well, that was one of the reasons that we had a little bit of trouble finding it is because of that. I said, I just couldn't. You know, determine. I but I know I noticed that this was the only house without the numbers on. I knew Wigglesworth's numbers were were this, but they're not there any longer. And she said, "Yeah, that's because two Christians came along and took them off the house, and ran away with them." She said. Now, if you know Brother Charlie, you know I'm just a little, I got a little bit of humor assigned to me. So I said, I said, yes, ma'am, I'm one of those crazy Christians, but I came to take your whole front door. <laughs> so when I said that, she started barrel, like belly laughing, and she said, do you want to come inside? I said, yes, of course, let me come in. So we came inside the house. Of course, Brendan and, and uh, a couple others were outside. We were in, indoors. Nehemiah disappeared. When we were in the house, I was talking to him. Later found out that he was in the kitchen getting himself a snack, <laughs> eating some chips and stuff, just having a good old time. L luckily, they, they were fine with it. They just smiled and tapped him on the head and just said, okay, bless you. But that house was important, and one of the reasons that we wanted to go over there was because we wanted to stand in the spot where Wigglesworth had prayed for Dr. Lester Summerall. Now, some of you may or may not know this, but uh, part of my spiritual legacy is, is in uh, both Wigglesworth and Lester Summerall uh, because both Brent and I served with uh, Rod Parsley, who uh, Pastor Parsley was passed the spiritual sword from uh, Lester Summerall uh, to his ministry and so we have a legacy in, in that. That's probably why I'm a little rough and gruff around the edges. Because if you ever watch Dr. Summerall, he was much more rough than I am. But in that house, there was a spot where Dr. Summerall would meet with Wigglesworth. In fact, when he came to Wigglesworth's home, he had a paper underneath his arm. The newspaper. And Smith Wigglesworth, he said, oh, what's that? And Dr. Summerall said, well, that's the newspaper. He said, uh, you can come inside, but you'll have to leave that trash on, on, on my porch. He said, I don't allow lies into my home. No, Wigglesworth said that. He just said, leave that trash outside. I don't know a lot of lies. The only thing we read around here is the Word of God. And so if you didn't know this, Wigglesworth would read the Word of God 30 minutes and then pray 30 minutes. How many did not know that? That was his prayer time, the way that he would do things. He would read the Word for 30 minutes with Dr. Summerall. They would read it together. And then they would pray for 30 minutes. Read the word for 30 minutes. Pray for 30 minutes. And they would do that for hours. That's how they would, they would uh, just spend fellowship time together. And, and Dr. Summerall said during the World War, right before it broke out, they were, they were uh, telling the Americans that they had to go home. They couldn't stay. And so uh, Dr. Summerall went to his last visit with Wigglesworth. And during that time... Wigglesworth said, let me bless you. And now every time that, uh, that Dr. Summerall would go see Wigglesworth, he would pray for him. He would bless him. And he said that every time I went to visit uh, uh, Brother Wigglesworth, he said, I would leave, and I felt like my insides were getting cleaned. Oh, wow. That's, That's how you know impartation's real. If you can get around somebody, now some people just going around laying hands on people and getting nothing. Get hands laid on you until, you know, 
your head's so full, full of the oil. It's just... But there are those that have impartation to give. Come on, somebody. Impartation's real. Paul said this. He said, I long to be with you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift that you might be established. So I believe in impartation. You get around somebody that's got something, I want it. I don't care what. I just, just, even if they don't like me. Just lay your hands. I don't care. <laughs> Praise God. And so uh, that last, that last uh, meeting with, with uh, Dr. Summerall, he walked in the house. He said, uh, Brother Wigglesworth, I'm going to have to go home. Uh, the war is about to, to break. And he said, uh, will you bless me? Will you pray for me? And, Wigglesworth said, get on your knees. And so he got on his hands and his knees. And he, this was the great prophecy that Wigglesworth came. And, and this is when he prophesied the, the waves of the, uh, of the spirit that were going to come on the earth. Whew. And he started weeping. He said, Dr. Summerall said, I felt the tears of the, of the man of God hit the top of my head and run down. He said it felt like tears of oil. But as he was praying, he went into an open vision, and he said, he said, I see it. I see it. He said there's going to come a move of the Spirit. And he said the first wave is going to be a healing wave, and I see it crashing on the shores of the earth. And it will hit and it will be a move of the Spirit. And he said people will understand healing, miracles, and deliverance like they never understood it before. And then suddenly he said, I see another wave coming. And it's crashing the shores of the earth. And he said it will be a move of the Word of God where people will begin to understand who they are in Christ. It'll be a move of the teaching of God's Word that will come. And then finally... Dr. Summerall said that he saw a third wave. And Wigglesworth began to cry. And he said, he said, I won't see it. But he said, you'll see it in this beginning infancy stage. And he said, the third wave will be the largest and it's going to be the Word and the Spirit coming together. And it will be the greatest move of God that the earth has ever seen. It will be the final move of God. And he told Dr. Summerall, he said that you'll, be the f you'll, you'll see the beginning of it. And of course, we know now that Dr. Summerall did see all three waves, because the first wave that Wigglesworth was talking about happened in the 1950s. Actually started in 1947 with the Latter Rain Movement in uh, the nation of Canada in an uh, Assembly of God church. The power of God hit during one of William Branham's meetings. Went through 47 all the way into the early 1960s. Many people called it the healing revival or the healing movement. This is where men and women of God got out of the four walls of the church denominational structure. And so much so that they had to go and get tents and put them up. Because the denominations, even the Pentecostal ones, weren't really receiving the men of God during that time. So men like Oral Roberts, A. Allen, Jack Coe had to go get tents. 
And they set them up all over the country. Thousands came to hear the gospel and miracles broke out and powerful displays of the presence of God broke in, in a mighty way. And this went all the way, really, many believe, until about 1963, 19, you could push it, about 1965. 1965 is where William Branham, who was the catalyst of the healing revival, went home to be with the Lord. He was in a terrible car accident and died. Also during that time, right around 1970, you have A. Allen going home to be with the Lord. Brother Allen passed away, and many things were kind of ill-spoken of him, but men of God that I was around said that they never heard or saw anything that was uh, written badly about his, about his drinking. So I have to go with the men of God that were around him and not necessarily what has been written. I love A. Allen. He's my favorite evangelist, miracle worker, revivalist. Um, he's a powerful man of God. Oral Roberts was the only one that made it out of that move. He transitioned into the charismatic movement where we see Catherine Kuhlman. This is when Oral Roberts left the Assembly of God and became a Presbyterian or a Methodist. Excuse me. How many did not know that? Oh, yes, he left the assembly of God. Every good man of God leaves the assemblies. I promise you. <laughs> I can name, name them all. Pastor Benny, Morris Cirillo, uh, uh, R.W. Shambach. Uh, I'll go down. The, you want me to keep going? Or Roberts. I, I'll just keep on. I'll just name every, I'll just name every person that's ever been used by God that was once in the assembly of God, just left. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Bill Johnson was a part of the assemblies. Did you not know that? Absolutely. Oh, I hope this is, is this still going on in the academy? Okay, <laughs> praise God. Yes. In fact, just about seven years ago is when, when uh, Bethel stopped giving their, their, uh, their dues to the assemblies. They were doing it for years just out of obligation. They felt to do it out of honor. But yes, Bill is a third generation preacher. His grandfather was an assembly. His father was assembly. He was a sent. Well, he was assembly. Now he's not assembly any longer. But yes, he was assembly of God. Mm -hmm. You want me to keep going? Because I can keep naming them. But they all left. They all left the assemblies. And excuse, he wasn't a Presbyterian. Or Roberts became a Methodist. Uh, and he went over and, and got uh, ordained through the Meth through Methodists because that was during the charismatic movement and everybody was coming in. You know, you had Anglicans getting full of the Holy Ghost during that time. Catherine Kuhlman had people that, you know, uh, Priests from the Catholic Church sitting on the third row of her meetings, getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, falling out in the power of the Lord. Right? She was much more gentler, right? Yeah. Just gentle, you know, praise the Lord. Not so rough and gruff like Jack Cole just kicking and punching people all the time. <laughs> Wigglesworth will punch him too. Yeah. yeah. But you have that first wave there, and then the second wave is the, it was the Word of God or the teaching. Uh, of the Spirit, which came in during really the part, uh, you know, the middle to latter part of the 1970s, went all the way through the 1980s. That was uh, two main streams during that time. One was the Word of Faith, which uh, I would consider Kenneth Hagin to be the apostolic voice, even though he was a prophet and a teacher was the main voice of that, where you get Kenneth Copeland, you get, uh, you know, Jerry Seville, you get uh, uh, Jesse DePlant. All those came out of, the, out of the word of faith. Then on the other side, you have, um, you have uh, Mumford, you have, um, you have uh, Jack Hayford, you have, um, oh, um, excuse me. I'm doing the best I can tonight to remember all, all, all on the other side there. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the man of God out of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, uh, Mahesh and Bonnie were part of that. 
Derek Prince, thank you very much. So Derek Prince was a part of that. All teaching ministries, teaching on the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, the, the, you know, and just learning who you are as a believer, learning about deliverance, learning about the Holy Spirit, teaching ministry, teaching, teaching, teaching. This is uh, one of the reasons that Branham also kind of went off in the end. Now, I don't, I, I, you know, that's what everyone believes, and I, I still honor the man of God. I think some of his teachings definitely went out of order, but he, knew, he could see that that was the direction that was coming. And although he was a prophet, he wanted to be a teacher. And people tried to tell him, don't teach the word of God, just prophesy. And he didn't want to do that. He wanted to teach. Yeah. And, and so, but he saw that wave that was coming. So that was that wave. Now we are in the third wave. Touch your neighbor say, we're in the third wave. We're in the third, we're in the third wave of this thing. That's where we're at right now. God chose you to be a part of that third way. So this is a move of the Word and the Spirit. And that's why I I am a stickler for the Word of God. I love teaching. I love preaching. I love worship. But I'm not going to worship all day. I want to learn the Word too. I like the balance of the both. Brother Hagin said if you stay in the middle of the road, you'll accomplish much. Don't fall into a ditch. Sometimes people get off into a ditch sometimes. They fall off in a ditch. They get off on some little tangent thing. We don't want to do that. We want to stay in the middle of the road. And so Timothy, Timothy is being told by Paul here, he's saying the, the Lord is, is speaking to him expressly about staying in the middle of the road, learning the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because we want to understand who we are in Christ. We want to be able to know who we are because uh, when we, we're not just led, we can't be led by our emotions. And we don't want to just live by experience in the sense of like we have a vision or a dream. Dreams and visions are awesome. But we need to know the Word of God to stand on it. Because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so when we have the word of God, we will not be tossed to and fro. But we will stand steady. And as we are planted on the mountain of God, we will be uh, an oak of righteousness that can stand any storm. Amen.